Hello, I'm Bob Newport. This is another of my Third Age Physics videos. In this one we're going to talk about radioactivity and radiation. I've split uh, the topic into two separate videos, so this is the first in a series of two. Let's get going. Pretty much as I said, it's about radiation. We're going to have a look at it from a scientific point of view. Uh, and uh, the slides that are coming up now are, as I said, the first part of a two-part video series. So let's move on. Uh, this is me. If you've seen other videos in this series, you'll be aware of this information already. Uh, at the top here, we've got um, uh, the address of my uh, of my blog, and there is a lot more background material on the topic that we're talking about now. Uh, on that blog, so I'd uh, I'd recommend going to have a look at it uh, and look for Third Age Physics as the title. You can find me on Twitter as well uh, and uh, on YouTube by searching um, for uh, my name as well. Uh, my profile at my old place of work um, at the University of Kent is is given here, and you'll notice down at the bottom I've acknowledged the university as well as um, the University of the Third Age uh, because um, both have been very supportive of what I'm doing here and the University of Kent in particular uh, have been very good at lending me bits and pieces uh, so that I can show demonstrations as part of this process. Okay, let's get stuck in. Well, on this slide we're essentially looking at uh, the topics that we're going to cover in the in the two videos that are making up this series. So this first one, um, which um, prosaically I shall simply refer to as part one, is, as I say, looking at, at the words, looking at the language that we need to use. So we need to understand what terms like half-life and um, alpha decay and all these other little bits and pieces mean um, so that we can move on then and make sense of radiation in the in the world around us. So we're going to have a look at these basic um, terms and definitions and so on. Uh, there's um, a little bit of history in there and a, at least a sight of some chocolate. None for us to eat, although if you choose to provide your own that's entirely up to you. Uh, and how we detect radiation. Um, you will see in the uh, screen at the bottom left that I've uh, I've got a Geiger counter here and we're going to take a, a, a peek at that because in, in part two uh, I'm going to be using it just to demonstrate a few bits and pieces. So moving on this is our first term really and it's the key word for everything that follows this word radioactive and all we're really meaning when we talk about a radioactive material is something that has atoms within it that spot spontaneously emit energetic particles or energy itself from uh, from their nucleus. Um, so let's look at an atom in its in terms of its makeup. Uh, this is carbon. Uh, it's the most common form of carbon called carbon twelve, and you find it written down both in this form and. Uh, this one in, in different books and so on. And what makes an atom carbon is that it has six protons within its nucleus. Now these are the positively charged particles that sit in a nucleus. There are six of them. So carbon is the sixth element in the periodic table. And because there are six positives in the nucleus, um, a, uh, a carbon atom will unless it's been affected somehow, will have six negatively charged electrons around it. So it keeps the charge balance. Six positives uh, in the nucleus, uh, six negatives in these uh, electrons around the outside. And then the nu nucleus can have other particles in there called neutrons. And these have no electrical charge. They are uh, neutral, as their name implies. Um, but of course they change the mass of the carbon atom. Uh, almost all of the mass of an atom is 
confined within the nucleus. A proton and a neutron have roughly the same mass as each other, but they're 2,000 times more massive than an electron, for instance. So the electrons make up a really tiny percentage of the mass of a whole atom. Pretty much all of it sits within the nucleus in the middle. So we can change the number of neutrons in a nucleus without that atom becoming uh, another type, another element. So it would remain carbon for as long as the number of protons stays at six. The number of neutrons can go higher, it could go lower. Um, it would still be carbon, it would just be a different form of carbon and that's what we need to <coughs> excuse me, look at now. There is a form of carbon uh, called carbon-14. Uh, and it's made up slightly differently. Now sadly in this diagram the colour coding is uh, is a little bit different. So in this diagram it's the blue uh, spheres in this nucleus that are the protons and you'll notice if you count them there are still six. So this is still carbon. And there are still six electrons in this case buzzing around in complicated shapes uh, in the diagram at least around the outside. But what's happened is that we now have more neutrons, and in this case they're red. So we've got here, what, um, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, we've got eight neutrons, and that's what makes it carbon-14. This number is simply a total count of the number of protons and neutrons. So this is telling us that this carbon atom will actually have more mass be more massive than this one. Uh, and this is an important form of carbon. This is actually the form of carbon that um, comes into its own when we talk about carbon dating uh, of archaeological artifacts and, and so on. And the key word in this uh, context uh, is this one down here, isotope. So these are two isotopes of carbon. They're both carbon, they both behave chemically as though they're carbon, so anything that contains this form of carbon can also contain this form of carbon. We wouldn't notice the difference in terms of, of, of how uh, the material is behaving chemically, but uh, the difference is that this has um, uh, two extra neutrons in the nucleus, eight rather than six, and um, this is unstable. So carbon-14 is actually a radioactive isotope of carbon. So we've got some key words under our belt already and that's actually quite useful. Now what is it? Well these energetic particles or um, it, pure energy in, in some cases in the form of, of a photon of light in fact um, are emitted because the nucleus is unstable. Uh, they're not sitting in uh, what is their lowest energy, their most stable state and they get to that state essentially by shedding the excess energy associated with this um, uh, unstable nucleus. Now it's certain combinations of neutrons and protons, so the number of neutrons, the ratio between the two, that determines whether one uh, isotope of an atom uh, is stable or unstable. Uh, and that's what leads us to this sort of change here. So carbon-14, this radioactive isotope of carbon, can decay uh, and it can when it does decay it actually turns into a completely different element it actually turns into nitrogen um, the stable form of nitrogen and as I say this is this is the process that gives us the technique of carbon dating and I'll tell you a little bit about that in part two um, of this pair of, of videos now we've got 92 uh, elements in our periodic table that are naturally occurring, right? And these are types of atoms. So an element is just a type of atom. We've created an awful lot more. Uh, there are 
many, many more uh, atoms that have been artificially created beyond the end of the periodic table, as it were, beyond uranium, which is number 92. But they are all highly unstable and they decay away by uh, radioactive uh, emissions, usually in very, very short periods of time. Um, but remember it's just the balance between the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus that tells us whether we've got something that's stable on the one hand or unstable uh, on the other. So it's not confined to these heavier elements in the periodic table, the ones with the larger numbers associated with them. Um, and that's quite important. So if we take a look at our um, periodic table, we go uh, all the way through to number 92 down here, uranium. So that's the end of 1 through 92 is the end of our list of naturally occurring uh, elements. So everything beyond 92, so all these elements here, and in fact, uh, these ones up here as well, these are all artificially made and they're all extremely unstable um, and a lot of the elements naturally occurring elements are radioactive as well uranium is a classic example of that uh, i think probably everyone knows that uranium is um, is radioactive Well, I promised you a sight of chocolate, so this is actually my favourite form of the periodic table. This is um, the periodic table cast in chocolate. Um, so this is, I think, probably uh, the only way you could, for instance, safely eat a radioactive, um, radioactive material. So a square of uranium in this form uh, might actually be quite tasty, who knows? Right, so we've talked about atoms, we've talked about elements, and we've talked about isotopes, and we've divided the isotopes into those that are stable, in other words, they don't undergo radioactive decay, and those that are unstable, the ones that do under, undergo radioactive decay. So let's have a look at the, at the makeup of the elements uh, in our periodic table. So here's the numbers one through out here will be 92 are naturally occurring um, uh, elements in the periodic table so one down here is hydrogen uh, 92 up here will be uranium uh, and on along this axis is the number of neutrons in each nucleus of those atoms for whatever they are and I think the thing to note down here, um, this line here, by the way, is just giving you equal numbers of neutrons and protons. It's not terribly useful in the context of what we're talking about. The key thing is these black squares that run roughly up the middle of this coloured band here. Um, those are the stable isotopes of the naturally occurring elements. There's a few more than that, so some elements have two or three stable isotopes. Um, but you'll notice these coloured ones off to either side. Absolutely all of those um, are radioactive. They are unstable nuclei, unstable forms of a particular element. So whilst we've got 92 naturally occurring elements, there are over a thousand isotopes. So those elements can be, um, um, can show up as it were, as a whole swathe of different isotopes. Still the element, because the element, like in the case of carbon, uh, is determined solely by the number of protons in the nucleus, remember. So there were six in the case of carbon, that's what makes it carbon. Um, but we can vary the number of neutrons, or nature can vary the number of neutrons. Uh, and that tells us that we've got for um, a given element, for instance, um, so we can take his carbon, number six down here, 
and you'll see that there's a whole range not only the stable um, carbon 12 down there six protons six neutrons but actually if you look at the colors to either side there's a whole range of carbon isotopes that are radioactive they are unstable uh, and that's that's an important observation for us to make so lots and lots and lots of isotopes many of which are radioactive now a um, little bit of history um, radioactive decay was actually first picked up by this chap Henri Becquerel uh, and uh, that was 1896 so we're back in the uh, for the UK at least the Victorian age um, and a great deal of investigation went on after that by some extraordinarily dedicated and clever people Marie Curie being one of them uh, her husband Pierre was involved uh, very much in this work as well. Nobody understood very much about radioactivity back then so it's not going to surprise anybody to learn that a lot of these early researchers were made um, ill, sometimes very ill, sometimes even fatally ill um, from the effects of the radioactive materials that they were uh, examining. I mean a side note to this I have to say is that Marie Curie did not die directly of radiation uh, poisoning. Um, she was, bless her, a volunteer radiographer in the First World War for the French. So she spent um, the years of the First World War using very early forms of X-ray apparatus um, behind the front lines um, looking for broken bones and so on. In the process saved I don't know how many lives, uh, it would have been a lot, but picked up because these early X-ray kits were um, um, nowhere near as safe as the current ones are, she picked up a lot of x-ray damage to her body in the process uh, and in fact it was um, as a result of her exposure to x-rays um, that she um, uh, that she was brought to her, um, her, her death eventually. Okay so back out from history again let's dive back into looking at our um, key terms and, and defining them uh, appropriately. There are a lot of forms of radioactive decay but three of them are uh, at the top of the list as it were uh, and in all the school textbooks for instance you'll see these three listed as, as being the principal forms uh, and they're designated alpha, beta and gamma using the Greek letters. Um, and we tell the difference between them um, because they behave differently if they're passing through a magnetic field. So here's a horseshoe magnet uh, around here. Um, or we let them go between two electrically charged plates. So this one you'll see is charged positive, this one negative. They'll be part of an electrical circuit. So one side's connected to the negative terminal of the battery, the other to a positive terminal, if you like. And the reason that these two experiments are important is that if we put particles with a charge on them through a magnetic field or through this gap between positively and negatively charged electrical plates, then anything with a charge is going to be deflected. So let's take this one as our example. Um, here's our negatively charged plate and we notice that one of the forms of radioactive decay is actually attracted towards it. So it's bent downwards towards this negative plate. Well if it's attracted to a negatively charged plate it tells us immediately that these radioactive particles must be positively charged. And conversely, um, these ones here get attracted always towards the positively charged um, plate here. And so these then must have a negative charge associated with them. 
negative attracts to positive and vice versa. And then the third type uh, we would notice goes all the way through without being deviated one way or another. So this one we can tell straight away has no electrical charge associated with it. And we get the same story up here with uh, letting them go, travel between the poles of a magnet. Uh, and in fact the forces up here are exactly the same forces that um, give us our electrical motors for instance. In that case we've got as our charged particles electrons in the copper wire within the motor. So they are travelling through between the magnets of our electric motor and they get pulled one way or another and that's actually what gives us the twisting motion that, um, uh, that means our motor works in the way that it does. This is always, also the way for instance that the Earth's magnetic field deflects charged particles that come from the sun and actually protect us from what would otherwise be extremely harmful uh, effects of those. But uh, the names came in after these sort of um, separations between types of, of radiation uh, were observed. The ones that went towards the negative plate, in other words the ones that cells carry a positive charge, were called alpha. The ones that were attracted towards the positive plate, so must be carrying themselves a negative charge, were called beta. And gamma were the ones that go um, undeviated uh, through the two and likewise with, with the magnet up here. So we have alpha, beta and gamma and those are our three principal forms of um, uh, radioactive decay product are three types of radiation. Now there's another difference between the two um, and that's how far they can penetrate through material and what sort of damage they do uh, in a material. Now I've put this diagram in, I'm not going to tell you which textbook because I think it's one of the most ridiculously silly uh, diagrams I've um, ever come across in this context because uh, basically it's telling you that alpha particles won't penetrate your skin, beta particles will go inside, um, so beneath the skin in other words, and gamma rays will go all the way through and will require you know a lot of concrete for instance or, or lead and something like that on the other side to stop them. So the thought of actually using your body as a way of differentiating between alpha, beta and gamma particles is, as I say, um, absurd in the extreme. So we'll go to something a little bit more safe um, and have a look now at what's going on uh, with these three different forms of, of radioactive decay. So alpha particles, the ones remember carrying a positive charge, and it turns out that they're positive because there are two protons within an alpha particle. In fact there are two protons and two neutrons. So it has two positive charges associated with it and it's quite massive because of that. Um, alpha particles are stopped by a thin sheet of paper and in the context of that silly picture of, of the hand that you saw in the previous uh, image, what that means is that alpha particles will be dot, uh, stopped actually by the layer of dead skin cells that are on the outside um, surface of our skins. So alpha particles, alpha radiation outside of the body uh, actually can do us no harm. Uh, the dead skin cells on the surface of our skin uh, are enough to stop them and they're dead anyway. So there's no damage done to, to our bodies. It's different, of course, if we were to breathe in radioactive material that contained, uh, that sorry, decayed through alpha radiation, uh, because that now is hitting the living cells on the inside of our lungs, for instance, uh, and can do then immense damage. That's something we'll perhaps talk about a little bit later on. 
uh, beta particles. These turn out to be electrons. So we had two protons, two neutrons in our alpha particle. Our beta uh, radioactive decay um, particle turns out to be an electron. So it has very, very tiny mass. One two thousandth, remember, of the mass of a proton or a neutron. Uh, that will go all the way through a sheet of paper with ease. But if you stick, uh, for instance, an aluminium tin can in its way, that will be enough to stop uh, a beta particle. It will be absorbed uh, in the aluminium. Gamma rays are a lot more energetic and they don't carry electrical charge, remember, they're neutral from that point of view. But they'll go all the way through a sheet of paper or um, you know, a, a, a thin sheet of aluminium. You'd need something like thick concrete or a slab of lead uh, to bring these to a stop. So shielding ourselves, in other words, against gamma rays uh, is actually quite tough. Now, I've mentioned already that our alpha particle contains two protons, two neutrons. Now, that makes it actually the nucleus of a helium atom. So all we'd have to do is add a couple of electrons to that, and this alpha particle would turn into a helium atom. Um, so this is actually carrying a lot of mass away. Helium itself, I should say, is not unstable. It's not a radioactive um, uh, element in any way, shape or form. Uh, none of its isotopes are. They're all stable. Uh, but um, we can take out something equivalent to the nucleus of helium from heavier elements and that becomes our, our alpha particle. So here's some examples, and this is actually the technical way that we as physicists would write this stuff down. It's an equation, in other words, but it's a nuclear equation rather than a mathematical equation. So if we're looking for alpha emitting nuclei, we could have, as an example, uh, plutonium. Now, you might have heard of plutonium. It's used in, in um, fast breeder reactors. It's used in the um, uh, more modern versions of nuclear weapons. Um, it's appeared in various TV programs in one guise or another, but it decays by emitting alpha particles. So in fact, if we take out all of this from the nucleus of plutonium, this 240, its total number of protons and neutrons will actually drop to 236. And in the process, we've removed two protons. And remember, it's the number of protons that tells us which element it is. So this has shifted now in the periodic table to uranium. So the product of plutonium after it's undergone this emission of an alpha particle is that we're left with uranium. Carbon we've mentioned already in the context of carbon dating, for instance, earlier on. And that actually is uh, a beta decay. So there's no significant mass associated with this. Um, this, you remember, has a negative charge, however, whereas this had two positive charges. But this beta particle is coming about because one of the uh, protons in our carbon-14 nucleus has um, split essentially into a proton and an electron. So we've got a positive charge left and it's thrown out this negative charge, this beta particle. But that means it's now got an extra proton, right? It's no longer got the six protons that made it carbon. It now has seven of them. And a nucleus with seven protons in is nitrogen. So we've skipped one in the periodic table. I couldn't find an element that you might have heard of as an example of a gamma emitter. So you're going to have to put up with um, dysprosium uh, as my example. So dysprosium doesn't 
morph into another element at all because the gamma particle carries neither mass nor charge it's just energy it's just a lump of energy as it were uh, that's come out of this dysprosium nucleus so we're still left with dysprosium but of course this dysprosium atom has less energy uh, than the one that started this process in the first place. Now how do we detect radiation? <clears throat> well we're going to use something called a Geiger counter um, and I've got uh, I've got one here that I'm going to show you so I'm just going to switch it on in the background uh, while I talk about uh, how the thing works. A Geiger counter is relatively simple it's basically a steel or some metal anyway tube uh, which is gas tight so inside there will be a gas typically something like argon although it doesn't have to be uh, and within it will be a metal rod okay now this metal rod will be positively charged and the outer case will compared to this rod anyway be negatively charged I mean it could be connected to the earth that's the common way of doing it but nevertheless from one to the other we're going positive to something that's more negative so if radiation comes in what we're hoping it will do is collide with one of the argon atoms inside and the energy that it imparts will kick off one of the electrons uh, of that argon atom and electrons being negatively charged will tend to be attracted to this positive metal rod going through the middle a flow of electrons just as in copper wire in our houses a flow of electrons is a current so if we connect a meter between the case of our Geiger counter tube and this uh, anode this metal rod that passes through the center will measure a current and that will tell us how much radiation is coming into this tube now you notice that there's a thin window on here um, and that thin window usually is enough to stop alpha particles getting in so Geiger counters in general not always but in general are far far better at picking up beta radiation and gamma radiation than they are alpha but nevertheless this is the basics of our Geiger counter and you'll see that this is also connected to a little loudspeaker hopefully you can hear the clicks uh, from my unit um, in the background okay so hopefully what you can see now down on my desktop is this thing here this is our Geiger counter all right so the clicks that are coming off it are mirroring the small um, fluctuations of this needle which you may or may not be able to see um, depends on how big a screen you've got really uh, but the key working part for us that we need to think about is this thing here this is the tube that I showed you in the diagram so here's our thin window on the top in fact it's covered with a, a metal mesh so that you know I don't do something silly let's stick my finger through the thin window metal case completely enclosing um, uh, an inert gas inside like argon as I said and then connected here through this cable um, so one lead in this cable is going to be connected to the electrode going through the middle the other one is going to be connected to the case all the way through to my meter here which is going to register the counts uh, and there's a loudspeaker built into it uh, which is giving us a click every time there's a radioactive particle going through this thin window uh, and registering inside now the clicks that you're hearing I should say are simply background radiation uh, these are this is radiation that we get all the time it's coming from space it's coming from the materials around us uh, it's very low um, and you know mankind has been receiving this level of background radiation since 
uh, since uh, we existed as a species. Okay, so let's flick back our camera positions again. And I'll turn this off so that we don't have annoying clicks in the background again. Because this now brings us to the point of talking about the, uh, the next word in our lexicon that we need to become familiar with. And it's a measure of the amount of radiation, uh, radioactivity uh, events that we're picking up. And it's named after, you remember I talked about Henri Becquerel um, initially, it's named after him. It's called, surprise surprise, the Becquerel. Uh, and it's a very simple unit. It's, it's just a measure of the number of radioactive decays per second. Now, if you could pick up those clicks from the Geiger counter earlier, um, you'll realise that there were less than one per second. I mean, it's a very low number. Um, so it will be a fraction of a Becquerel. But there are other measures, me uh, measures of, of radiation. Um, and a really useful one is this thing called the sievert, again, named after um, somebody who uh, did a lot of work on on this sort of stuff. And the sievert is used by um, uh, radiation safety officers, for instance. It's, it's very good as a measure of the potential damage to living tissue the radiation uh, produces. And in fact, the unit you'll see mostly used is not the sievert, but the millisievert, which is, is one thousandth uh, of a sievert. And that gives us a measure then of the uh, danger that a certain amount of radiation um, poses to living organisms of one form or another. So moving on, um, radioactive nuclei don't just all decay immediately. Uh, they decay at random. Um, and we use something called a half-life in order to describe the rate at which these nuclei uh, are decaying. So a half-life is just the time it takes for half of the initial number of radioactive atoms to have undergone uh, a decay. So the example I've given on the screen here is that if we start with a thousand uh, radioactive um, atoms, then 500 of them will be left undecayed after a period of time that we now define as the half-life. So if we waited another period of time, uh, the same time, so another half-life, we would then go down from our 500 on average uh, to 250 that were left undecayed. And that goes on and on uh, in that process. Now, remember, this is random. Uh, you cannot predict when an individual atom's nucleus will undergo a radioactive decay. So all we're talking about when we're talking about the half-life is an average, a statistical average over a number of radioactive atoms. So that's all it is. Uh, the actual individual nucleus is going to decay or not decay uh, at random. There's no way of forcing this process. So you, you don't change it by heating the material up or cooling it down or hitting it with, with a hammer um, or staring hard at it. It'll decay uh, at this average rate uh, irrespective of what you do. So this is a little animation, uh, a cartoon, uh, as it were, and I've put the link to this in, in the blog post, along with links to a lot of other things, uh, which gives us um, a visualization of what's going on. So the red parts of this square here designate radioactive atoms that have yet to decay. All right, and I'll turn white in this animation when that uh, radioactive event has, has taken place. 
So if I run this simulation and just let you watch it, um, you can see what's going on and, and the, there's a count of the number of decayed uh, atoms showing down the bottom which you would expect to rise. Okay, so here we go. And that's it. So we started, let me go back and show you that again. Uh, we started with um, two and a half thousand in this grid um, and then we see them decay randomly um, as we uh, as we allow time to progress. Okay, so for each half-life, about half of those red squares will have decayed and turned white in our cartoon. After another half-life, half of the remaining red squares will decay and turn white, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is something called an exponential decay, so it goes by factors. Uh, it goes half, 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 half after uniform periods of time. You'll have come across recently the term exponential uh, when people have been talking about, um, you know, the rise of, of COVID infection numbers and so on. It's a term that's used a lot. It's also a term, I have to say, that's endemic to processes in, in nature, including radioactive decay. So this is showing the results of what we had before, but in the form of a graph. We started with two and a half thousand uh, squares up here, and each half-life, we got half of those decaying into something else. Um, we're only gonna look at this blue curve uh, for now. So if we start with two and a half thousand, after one half-life, we would expect about 1250 to be left, right? So that's what here. So somewhere over here, one half life must have passed in time because we're down to half the number um, of uh, undecayed nuclei. So if we track down here, if I can get this vaguely right, this sort of time period in here bit more than one on this scale, whatever this scale is, is a half-life. So if we went up another one, um, so we'd be a little bit over here, we would expect to be at half the 1250, so about 625. So if we track up, let's just check, well yeah that's, you know, that's about 625, it's about half of our 1250. So every time we move a half-life along here, we get a halving of the number of undecayed nuclei left. Right. So here's an example. Here's a, a, a real example, as it were. This is barium, barium-137, uh, and this is used in, in uh, medical diagnostics. Some of you will be aware of, of the way that barium is used in, in the human body to track certain things, um, and it decays in exactly the same way. Uh, it decays uh, on a um, an exponential curve, like the one shown in green in this diagram. Now I told you that these radioactive decays are random events, so we actually get a bit of a scatter around our green exponential. It doesn't sit perfectly on this line. This is a random process. So all we can talk about is a statistical average. And that we found over the years for radioactive events is always gonna follow this exponential decay, okay? So we could estimate, for instance, the half-life of barium fairly easily. We start up here at, you know, this whatever this number here is, 170-ish, we'd have to take off 10 because this is the 
the background, the stuff I showed you with the Geiger counter earlier. So let's say we start at 160, we drop down to 80, plus our background, which takes us up a bit. So we're over here somewhere, um, and that, to my eye, looks like we've got, I don't know, about 200 seconds has passed. So that would suggest to me that that's about the half-life. Uh, this is very crude estimate I'm doing here. So if we were to step up another couple of hundred, we should expect to be at half that level. So we'd be up here somewhere, wouldn't we? And we'd expect to be in the region of 40, and lo and behold, we are. So this is how half-lives work. This tells us a little bit about the rate at which nuclei are decaying. Now, an interesting thing in nature is that we can decay from one unstable atomic nucleus into a stable one, but we can also decay into something which is itself unstable. And so it'll undergo a radioactive decay of its own at some stage. Uh, and we get something then called a decay chain. So one thing decays into another, which is also radioactive, that decays into another, and so on and so on, all the way until we end up with something that is, uh, is stable. And um, uranium, or at least this one particular isotope of uranium, uh, gives us a good example of this, because it starts off as a radioactive uh, element, at right at the top end of our periodic table. But over a very long period of time, its half-life is actually about the age of the Earth, um, it will decay into something stable, in this case lead. But it does so in a very long, complex way. So let me show you this up here. So here we are up at uranium. It's got 92 protons in its nucleus, that's what makes it uranium but it has a whole stack of neutrons in there. So the total number, protons plus neutrons, actually comes to this whopping total of 238. But that decays with this very long half-life, remember. Uh, it decays into something called thorium. So a different element, it's lost four, in its mass, remember, this is an alpha decay. So two neutrons, two protons uh, have been kicked out of our uranium uh, nucleus and we're left now with a different element, thorium. And that decays into a, another element, palladium up here, um, and it does that with a half-life of only 24 days. So it's a higher rate process. And when we see a transition like this, we've actually had an increase in atomic number. We've gone up from 90 to 91, look. That's telling us this is a beta decay. We've had a neutron that's divided, in essence, into a proton and an electron. Um, the electron is what makes it beta decay, but we've got an extra proton in the nucleus now. So that makes it another element. And actually, there's a beta decay from uh, this isotope as well, with a very short half-life. This is now a little over a minute, um, just under one and a quarter minutes. Um, and that decays into yet another isotope of uranium. So this is another beta decay. We've added another proton to the nucleus. So it's gone back up again to 92 now, but this is a different isotope of uranium. This is uranium-234. So it's fewer neutrons in it, remember. And then we get a whole series. We go back through another isotope of thorium again. We get to radium, radon. Uh, we'll talk about those two later on, very important. Um, polonium. You might remember this. This is a nasty radioactive material. It's what was used in the poisoning of, um, of Mr. Litvinenko a few years ago. Uh, 
Um, we come down now to a radioactive form of lead. Skipping up again, beta decays, and then wiggling all the way around, we end up with the stable form of lead. So it has 82 protons in its nucleus, that's what makes it lead, um, and the total number of protons and neutrons is 206. That balance between protons and neutrons um, is what makes this the stable form of lead. Uh, so this is our classic cathedral roof material way down here, but we could make it if we've got long enough time from this radioactive form of uranium. So that's a decay chain. And you'll be pleased to know that we've got to the end of uh, part one. So this is my attempt to go through key words and phrases and concepts. Um, you've now got available to you the range of language that we're going to need to make sense of what's coming up uh, in part two. So I'll see you there. Bye for now.